Hello, welcome to today's webinar, Global Perspectives, Three Education Strategies That Transcend Borders. My name is Jessica Heitner, and I'm the Director of Advancement at Teach United. We are honored to be with you today and hope to provide useful information during our time together. We will use the first half of the meeting to discuss the current state of education. And in the second half, you'll hear from our coaches and partner teachers with the ways that they're using universal strategies to improve teaching practices and student outcomes. Just a few housekeeping items before we get started. We are holding time um, at the end for a question and answer panel with our presenters. If you have a question throughout the presentation, um, in the chat box, please send a direct chat to Heather Heap, our CEO. Heather's waving there for you. Um, she will facilitate either throughout the presentation or during the dedicated Q&A time at the end. Also, all attendees will receive a copy of our recorded webinar in the next few days. So um, be on the lookout for an email from Teach United with a link to these resources. Teach United was established in 2016 to ensure that every child has access to quality education. And the best way to ensure that is by supporting educators in the classroom, arming them with the skills needed to improve their effectiveness and help students thrive. With a focus on small, rural, and underserved communities in Latin America, East Africa, and the United States, Teach United partners with schools, districts, education-based NGOs, state and ministry edu ministries of education um, to provide high impact professional learning and one-on-one -on -one coaching. Um, today's presenters, we have Gadibo Tindwa. Gadibo represents Teach United as the senior director of the East Africa region. He brings nearly 15 years of experience in international development with a focus on education um, and organizational development sports for development initiatives and influencing systemic change. Also joining us is Megan Casey. She is our senior director in Latin America and she has been a key member of our Latin America team since inception. She is passionate about nature and conservation, sustainable community development and bringing innovative quality education to low income rural areas of Latin America. Joining us from the US is our senior director, Heather Wilmot. Heather brings nearly 20 years of experience in education and leadership to her Teach United, to her Teach United role. Um, she is trained as an instructor, instructional coach and a certified superintendent of schools. And Heather is an ardent believer in harnessing the power of education to transform the lives of youth. Um, last but certainly not least is Aaliyah Thompson. She is our director of product and implementation and monitoring and evaluation. Um, with more than 10 years in education as a classroom teacher, social emotional learning program manager, and post-secondary leadership trainer, Aaliyah is steadfast in serving students and educators. And then like I mentioned, um, you'll also hear from our CEO, Heather Heach, a little bit later, as well as from coaches and some of our partner teachers and administrators from communities around the world. And we really just want to send a very special thank you to them for sharing their experiences today. Um, and with that, I'm going to hand things over to Aaliyah. Thank you, Jess. Uh, hi, everyone. Nice to see you all. Uh, as Jess mentioned, I'm Aaliyah Thompson. I'm joining today from Massachusetts in the United States. These days, it really often feels like we're living through a series of crises, both educational and otherwise, um, many of which have been exacerbated by the pandemic. And when we look globally, we see both challenges and opportunities. We know teacher morale has been significantly impacted. And the research shows us that many student outcomes are declining or stag have stagnated in recent years. And when we look at the last two years, really at this point, a little more than two years, we know students have faced significant traumatic stress, both directly and indirectly from COVID, uh, dealing with school closures, disrupted access to learning, and for many of them, uh, a very real impact with the loss of a family member or loved one. And our educators, who are our best and most important resource for students, 
uh, they're facing equally daunting situations. It is perhaps no wonder we're looking at a global shortage of over 69 million educators, as well as huge waves of current teachers considering leaving the educational profession entirely. But even among these incredibly hard times and all this stress, educators continue to move the needle for students through their hard work. Uh, as part of a global study on educational trends, Google tracked trends from across the world that we're seeing have an impact, a positive impact on student outcome. We're looking at increased collaboration, more student-led learning in the classroom, and innovative ways of teaching and learning through the use of technology that will help students graduate prepared for a successful future. We at TU, we see these trends both in what our partner schools are doing and the, how, our education, um, how our instructional coaches are supporting educators. And to speak to this more directly, I'd now like to introduce Gadibo, Senior Regional Director, who will be speaking about what we see in East Africa. Thank you, Alia. My name is Gadibo. I'm joining today from Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. Um, as my colleague has mentioned, some of the challenges that we are seeing across the education space cut across geographies and uh, areas that we operate in. In the case of East Africa and more specifically in Tanzania, um, we're seeing tremendous success in the free public education policy where over 96% of school age students are enrolled in primary education. However, over 60% of those do not transition into secondary education where we're seeing only 31% uh, of uh, secondary school age students are enrolled in the education system. Some of these data sets raise some fundamental questions um, that we can take into consideration to understand what this means. There are questions around other costs related to accessing education, uh, costs like transport, uniform, which are also make it difficult for families to access the education across the region. With the success of, uh, from their enrollment, we're seeing new challenges that are coming up with the teacher-student ratios, uh, at the moment, the ratio stands at six, 56 teacher, um, students per one teacher, and the shortage in 2019 was above 80,000 teachers, making it difficult to provide uh, access to content. And uh, with the pandemic happening, we also have uh, seen challenges about our own teachers being able to deliver the content uh, just through distance learning. Challenges delivering cur curriculum are also um, making a priority between delivering the curriculum versus best practices when it comes to uh, when students come back to the classroom. Large class sizes, also difficult to maintain social distancing when schools reopen. But despite all these challenges, we are seeing a lot of efforts in different directions to try and address some of the issues. Some of the quick examples that we are seeing in Tanzania is the recent launch of the 15,000 classrooms that were recently built by the government. Um, the announcement for uh, 245 secondary schools that are specifically going to be built to, uh, for girls students and the government investing over 180 billion to, uh, to build those schools. We're also seeing um, a new teacher vacancies being announced, so that means that would slowly start to address the teachers, uh, the gaps in teachers per student, but also um, improvement in the quality of education being delivered. So as, as we've seen the challenges, but the future is really optimistic and we're, uh, we're optimistic about what that looks like in, uh, for our students and learners. I will now invite my colleague, Megan Casey, to speak more to this context in the uh, uh, context of Latin America. Hola, muchas gracias. Saludos a todos. Estoy conectando hoy con ustedes desde Sarapiquí, Costa Rica. Thank you, Gribo, and hello to everyone. I'm joining you today from Sarapiquí in Costa Rica. The panorama of public education in the rural areas of Latin America is um, not great. Central America is facing what is called the worst crises in the last three decades. Um, being likened to the time when the political military conflicts devastated the area less than 50 years ago. So despite some tangible achievements in human development generated um, by the integrationist movement um, over the last 50 years, the, the multi-country collaboration is, is showing clear signs of political exhaustion. 
according to the 2021 State of the Region report for Central America. Um, it's highlighting low coverage in preschool and secondary education, um, an increase in ecological debt, more resources for the armed forces, low funding for justice, uh, strong economic contraction. The prevalence of unsophisticated economies with low value add and little job creation and substantial deterioration and evaluation of democracy, um, all of which has now been um, compounded by the COVID pandemic. Specifically in Costa Rica over the last four years, there have been um, repeated and significant interruptions of school cycles, which have caused a sharp cut in student learning in what is being called an educational blackout by the recent State of Education 2020 run report for Costa Rica. Um, Pre-pandemic, about 30% of 15-year-olds dropped out of education before finishing and 33% lacked the basic skills in science, reading, or math. So similar to other regions, uh, learning loss is a significant issue. Um, it is estimated that the accumulation of lessons lost due to strikes and the pandemic is equivalent in a regular school year to 80% in primary and 72% in secondary. And it is estimated um, that Costa Rica will regress up to 30 points in the international PISA test if it doesn't reverse the learning lags. We're also witnessing a new kind of educational exclusion. Um, close to 40% of students in Costa Rica did not have adequate conditions of connectivity and access to the technological resources during the pandemic. And this seems to be a similar or worse um, trend in other countries in the region. The 2021 State of Education in Costa Rica report argues that the quality of teaching practice is the most relevant factor to quickly and effectively influence the success of students. Yet according to the report, the teaching staff in the country apply few effective teaching practices to achieve high levels of proficiency which means the gap between the current teaching practice and Costa Rica's learning goals is significant. And teacher evaluations show that 40% of English teachers and 29% of math teachers do not master the content of the curriculum they're supposed to teach. Um, teaching digital skills is also at initial levels with the majority just beginning to incorporate the use of technology and six out of 10 teachers in Costa Rica do not have the preparation or training to teach virtual or distance courses. The problem is deepened because as the report argues, the educational system is operating blindly with no standardized evaluations and the suspension of national exams over the last few years. So currently the educational context in Costa Rica specifically and Latin America in general is, is difficult. Um, and globally, we know that students and teachers share so many challenges, um, but working with communities and teachers through Teach United motivates us daily. Um, and we're excited to share with you a little later on some of the ways our team and partners on the ground are working to support quality education in the region. Uh, I'm gonna pass it over now to Heather Wilmot, who is going to share with us a little bit more about the US context. Thanks, Megan. I'm joining from Milwaukee, Wisconsin in the United States. So, you know, life after a crisis is surely unsettling. And as with many countries around the world, the U.S. is continuing to grapple with the continuing effects of the COVID pandemic and managing emergencies associated with the health of our public. And though some U.S. states have moved on from an emergency status, U.S. federal officials still remain cautious. The pandemic has really revealed for us how critical and fundamental socialization is in our lives. Schools where desks would be close together to facilitate collaboration and inquiry were forced to separate for long periods of time. And the role of proximity changed the day-to-day -day functioning of schools, whether it was navigating the classroom environment or the less structured areas of a school community. As we are working toward recovery, Divisions in school boards and school com communities continue to persist. And navigating protocols and vaccination programs 
impact the natural ebb and flow of school operations and interactions. In addition to schools being faced with teacher shortages, our U.S. families are also dealing with adapting to modified school schedules and the difficulty surrounded with trying to find childcare. But not only do we need to be concerned about whether our students are learning enough, this purports us to better understand what this really means. And if our students aren't learning, how do we respond to accelerate their learning? And what is our role as a collective community? So yes, learning is important, but we also need to take into consideration factors that will influence how our students will be successful in the future and how they will live happy lives. So teacher shortage is not a new issue in the US, but the pandemic has further entrenched the problems. Before the pandemic, there were over 340,000 fewer students across the US choosing to enroll in teacher preparation programs. And there was a recent survey by the American Association of Colleges for Teacher Education that reported a further decline. 11% decrease in undergraduate programs and a 13% decrease in graduate enrollment. There was a national survey of district leaders included in the educator supply and demand report. And that showed that 16% of the new teachers hired between 2020 and 2021 were individuals who were not fully prepared. That was nearly an 80% increase since 2014 and 2015. There is there's such pressure for classroom coverage in our U.S. schools. And with the increased concerns about preparedness, schools need to offer more support to new educators. But this is really a time where schools are struggling to help them. And districts across the U.S. have also indicated that one of the most critical staffing issues right now is the lack of substitute teachers. Some of our states are even asking for intervention and help from the National Guard, as New Mexico is one of those examples. New Mexico and Oklahoma are also using state employees to provide coverage in our classrooms. So what does this mean for learning for our kiddos? And the pandemic really has not disrupted life for all students equally, and that's important to note. It has been more significant and it has had a longer impact for underserved and vulnerable students, thus perpetuating inequities for our U.S. youth. So whether it's virtual access, home support, hunger, accommodations, and displacement, these are all critical concerns, especially for underserved learners in the U.S. In Bellwether Education's recent publication, it was estimated that nearly 3 million vulnerable students had been offline during distance learning opportunities. NWEA provides a standardized test for measuring achievement and growth in academics. And this provides teachers with evidence to help target instruction for students, regardless of how far or how above grade level they may be. But the national results revealed that the biggest drops in student performance in grades three through eight were for students of color and students who attended low-income schools. So unfinished learning, we need to pay attention to this because this could have an impact on U.S. economics. The fallout from the pandemic threatens to negatively impact this generation's prospects and it could constrict their opportunities into their adulthood. This ripple effect, as one might say, could impact college attendance and ultimately finding a fulfilling job that enables them to support their future families. For example, recent data included in a McKinsey report suggests that unless unfinished learning is addressed head on, today's students may earn anywhere between $49,000 and $61,000 less over their lifetime. And this has potentially an impact on our U.S. economy. And this could amount to $128 billion to $188 billion every year that this generation enters the workforce. And I know this might feel like a grim picture. And yes, things in our U.S. schools and communities may not be optimal, and they may not be at their ideal state, but there is hope. And there are innovative ways to approach these complex problems 
because remember, we are better when we are united. And I would love to turn this back over to Aaliyah, my esteemed colleague. Thank you, Heather. To pick up on that thread, um, despite the challenges we heard about from all these regions and connecting us globally, we're also better equipped to help students and teachers now more than any point in the past. Thanks to the work of our educators on the ground and the researchers who support them, we know what works to make schools better to help students and we know how to implement it. Teachers matter. When I think about the impact of teachers, I like to talk about this both academically and personally or emotionally. Many of us have been lucky enough to have an educator who's changed our life for the better. Um, I'm lucky enough to have more than I can count on one hand. We know that teachers matter. We've always known that. What's new or what's increasing is that now we have the evidence that tells us specifically how educators impact student outcomes and what we can do to help educators in their work. Research confirms that of all school related variables, educator effectiveness has the biggest outcome, uh, sorry, the biggest impact on student outcomes. And it's not just for student achievement or test scores. It, teachers also matter for other metrics like attendance, progress and persistence through school and student well-being. Given that educator effectiveness has such a large impact on students, then we need teacher professional development that works to support that effectiveness. For those of us who've been educators, uh, we know there's a lot of PD and there's a lot of bad or maybe even just ineffective professional development. A workshop you attend or a training you go to where you never use the strategies discussed later. What you'll learn from our regional directors and our instructional coaches is something different. We know that for professional development to be effective, it has to be actionable. It has to be real and embedded in the teacher's classrooms, and it has to have an element of collaboration so that they can learn from and with each other. Because of that, we use an instructional coaching model here at TU, where content, coaching, and community form an ongoing, supportive, application-focused experience for educators. But in order to have effective PD, you don't just need a good model, you also need really good content. And you need to focus on the most impactful strategies. So how do you decide what to cover? That's where effect size comes in. You likely have heard this term from educational researchers like John Hattie or other educational researchers if you read the nerdy academic journal articles like I do. Um, and there are a lot of ways to calculate effect size, but for this brief overview, I'll be using the most common, uh, which is Cohen's D. And effect size really is just the way to understand not only that something works, but how much it has for an impact. So the point four hinge point that you'll see on this slide here is where strategies have a larger impact than both the typical effects of the year of schooling. I mean, we know students grow and mature throughout a year uh, and the impact of a typical educator. Anything above a point four is considered to have a large positive impact on students. And the three strategies we'll talk about and hear from our coaches and educators those all fall into this area, this zone of desired, in, uh, desired effects. And the first strategy, uh, it's, and in some ways the most foundational, is collective teacher efficacy. The, this focus is on ensuring educators believe that together they have the power to impact their students. It's really the underlying factor um, of everything else because without this belief, without this certainty, nothing else changes. It's collective, it's based in educator mindset, and in their sense of agency. Now, one thing I like to point out, it's not just about teachers feeling good about their work um, or having good relationships with their colleagues. This is about educators having structured collaborative opportunities to make the decisions that then they see the positive results, they see the improved outcomes for their students. And the second strategy we're going to be talking about today is engagement. As we heard from our wonderful regional directors, we're all facing challenges. 
some shared, some different. And yes, every classroom teacher, every student is different. But engagement and learning cuts across all those differences. Um, what we focus on in TU here is the difference between kind of attention and engagement. We're not just helping teachers ensure on task behavior. Uh, instead, our coaches are helping teachers create an environment where students want to learn, where the students are invited to own their own learning and they're excited to continue their progress forward. And lastly, we're gonna talk about data. It's a big word in education these days. Um, I like to think of it as data in service of learning. We need data to help us understand what is working, what is not, what we wanna change. Too often educators are given data or analyzed data and no actionable steps are taken. There's actually been some great recent research on this um, where data analysis in a vacuum, it doesn't work. It doesn't change what teachers are doing and it certainly doesn't impact student outcomes. Instead, at Teach United, our instructional coaches help educators understand data in the service of the work they're doing. What questions they have, what they want to know, how can they improve their work? We're raising comfort and fluency within the data cycle, from collecting it to understanding it to, most importantly, making changes as a result of it. In each of these concepts, among all the others that we touch on in our professional development, they're taken and adapted, contextualized, and put into practice by the wonderful instructional coaches and partner educators around the globe. So now let's hear from the people on the ground actually doing the work. Hello. Hola, Pura Vida from Costa Rica. I'm Megan Casey. Hi, I'm Chesco Sowo. I'm a coach and the Monitoring and Evaluation Associate in Teach United. My name is Megan Antal, and I'm joining you from the Southern United States. I'm a U.S. Instructional Coach for Teach United. Hola, mi nombre es Melissa Arroyo Vargas. Pertenezco al Centro Educativo Escuela Finca 6, y mi especialidad es Informática Educativa. My name is Agnes Lukumai. I'm from Wengutoto Secondary School here in Monduli District. In Arusha region, I'm teaching English language. Hola, mi nombre es John Solís y soy el director educativo para Latinoamérica del proyecto Teach United. Tengo en la organización más de siete años de experiencia y me encanta ser entrenador en este proyecto. Hi, I'm Heather Wilmot, Senior Director of U.S. Programs with Teach United. Hello, Habari. Hola, mi nombre es Arleni González y soy maestra en el Centro de Educación Creativa en Montevideo. Hi, my name is Niana Sims. I am an elementary principal of a K-2 building, um, Lincoln Elementary in Torrington, Wyoming. Habari. Hola, mi nombre es Armando Bello. Soy gerente de operaciones para Tissue United Latinoamérica y desde Costa Rica les envío un gran abrazo. Pura vida. With a growth mindset, students and educators build the belief that intelligence, talents, and skills can grow with meaningful effort. Con una mentalidad de crecimiento, los estudiantes y educadores construyen la creencia de que la inteligencia, los talentos y las habilidades pueden crecer con un esfuerzo significativo. In rural Serapiqui, Costa Rica, which is one of the richest counties in Costa Rica in terms of biodiversity, yet poorest in economic terms, in large part due to the monoculture production of banana and pineapple in the region, a fixed mindset or the belief that some students are naturally good at some things and not others often dominates in families and even in educational centers. Learning to identify how we employ a fixed mindset or a growth mindset in different areas of our life and the consequences of each mindset helps us to recognize our attitudes and behaviors and move away from limiting ideas and fear of failure and learn to embrace challenges and failure as part of our learning. Requires that we recognize that we can, that we all can learn and grow and improve. 
Cuando los estudiantes son conscientes de su capacidad y entienden que el esfuerzo es importante independientemente del resultado, es mucho más sencillo generar en ellos una práctica constante de mentalidad de crecimiento, porque se crea una aceptación al error, se entiende que equivocarse es una señal de que estamos aprendiendo y no todo lo contrario. Los docentes debemos usar frases que motiven a los estudiantes a valorar el proceso y que se genere una motivación interna. Frases como buen trabajo, excelente esfuerzo, falta poco, me encanta esa actitud positiva. De esa forma, independientemente del resultado final, los estudiantes van a enfocarse en el proceso y lo van a disfrutar mucho más. También animan a sus compañeros a intentar y a esforzarse. Los estudiantes tienen bastante claro el concepto y cómo aplicar la mentalidad de crecimiento. Ellos lograron expresar con claridad sus ideas respecto a lo que para ellos significa. La actividad del dado con frases relacionadas a la mentalidad de crecimiento como yo aprendo de mis errores cuando, yo alcanzo mis objetivos cuando, yo doy lo mejor de mí cuando, yo soy capaz de, yo no soy capaz de todavía, pero con esfuerzo lo conseguiré, yo lo vuelvo a intentar cuando. Eso les hace analizar desde una perspectiva personal qué han mejorado y en qué pueden seguir trabajando, siendo conscientes que es un proceso de tiempo y de paciencia con uno mismo. Tradicionalmente América Latina se ha caracterizado por tener grupos poblacionales con mentalidades poco dispuestas al cambio y con temor a los retos. Esto lo hemos visto evidenciado en las aulas a las cuales visitamos. Este es el ejemplo de la profesora Vilma Alfaro, maestra con más de 27 años de servicio en la educación costarricense. La maestra Alfaro impartía lecciones de ciencias, español, estudios sociales y matemáticas a su grupo de quinto grado de la escuela Ida Huetá, una escuelita rural en la región atlántica de Costa Rica. A la llegada de Teach United, Vilma aceptó ser parte del proyecto sin embargo, poco convencida de que esto llegaría a ser funcional para ella y sus estudiantes. Inclusive habló con ellos y les comentó, aunque estemos en este proyecto, yo no voy a cambiar mi forma de dar las clases utilizando la pizarra y el marcador. A lo largo de los primeros dos meses de trabajo con la maestra Alfaro, empezamos a notar un cambio importante en su forma de pensar. Se interesó en buscar una estrategia que incluya el uso de la tecnología para explicar el tema de fracciones lineales a sus estudiantes. Después de encontrar el recurso ideal y aplicarlo con sus estudiantes, Vilma confesó que en sus muchos años de trabajo nunca había obtenido tan buenos resultados con sus estudiantes en este tema. A partir de ese momento, ella siguió utilizando más y mejores estrategias y recursos que lograrán captar la atención y el interés de sus estudiantes. La experiencia en esta escuela fue realmente productiva, ya que su cambio de mentalidad influenció a otros maestros. Hoy en día, la Escuela Ida Huetar sigue siendo un ejemplo para otros centros educativos y su interés por el cambio y mejora constante son parte del quehacer diario. El caso de la maestra Alfaro es solo un ejemplo de cómo un maestro acostumbrado a hacer siempre lo mismo y estar seguro de que lo hace bien, puede adaptarse al cambio, superar sus miedos y adecuar su instrucción a los intereses y necesidades de sus estudiantes. To most of my teachers that I have been coaching, they thought that there are some of the students that even if they can go with them to their home and teaching, the students won't like learn anything. But in Teach United, we open up that these students, they can learn. But what just to consider is the growth of mindset to both teachers and the uh, students. I had a partnership with the, my, my teacher, Redemta, from Olesakoeno Secondary School and uh, He was, she was thinks that uh, they, can learn, they cannot learn the English language as what she thought before. But uh, after attending the Teach United training, she, she trained students on how she, they can embrace uh, mistakes as the opportunity for them to learn more. She also adapted the success folder as the way to encourage students that the last exam you had this score 
and the following exam you had this score so you can see the way your grades they are improving even though it doesn't matter they are growing in a very slowly but the matter is your grades are changing and the process of you to learn is changing when I think of growth mindset in our schools here in the United States, I see it as a practice that is slowly and very importantly becoming more visible. In any school building, growth mindset takes root first at the top, starting with school leadership and with our teachers. It's based in leaders, both in and out of the classroom, who know how to critically examine their own mindset first, looking for those moments of fixed mindset versus growth mindset. They then use this knowledge to focus on their own process rather than the end result, embracing challenges or mistakes as great learning opportunities and chances to grow along the way. In my mind, these leaders and teachers are at the heart of collective efficacy. They truly believe in the power of yet, and they back up these beliefs with both the statements that they make and the actions that they take. In other words, they truly believe that any child or school building can do great things. And they back up these beliefs through strategic, data-centered work, achieving goals through continual examination of the process. Once these practices are in place with our leaders, the growth into our classrooms is only natural. Leaders and teachers who are versed first in their own mindset become natural models for our students. Engagement can be defined as the degree of attention, curiosity, interest, optimism, and passion that both students and the educators have in teaching and learning. El compromiso se puede definir como el grado de atención, curiosidad, interés, optimismo y pasión que tanto los estudiantes como los educadores tienen en la enseñanza y el aprendizaje. Teacher and student engagement is such an important concept. Engaged teachers are better teachers and engaged students really learn and grow. Identifying what engagement actually looks like for us as educators and being able to distinguish real engagement from forms of participation like ritual compliance or strategic compliance permits us to analyze what motivates our students and what strategies we can employ to increase their engagement. Prioritizing genuine student engagement ultimately requires that we find new and better methodologies to reach our students and make the learning relevant to them and motivate them to become invested in their own learning and educational success. Teachers who understand the importance of student engagement are willing to take risks and step out of the norm and try innovative strategies in the classroom that are centered around student mastery. It is motivating to see teachers who have spent years teaching the same way embracing new strategies and the most motivating is witnessing the change in the students and their increased engagement and success. In recent research by the National Association for Elementary School Principals, it indicated that culture exerts a powerful impact on teaching, learning, and everything else that takes place in school. Culture is important as it impacts how teachers respond and interact with students but also with each other. And an element that contributes to school culture is connectedness and engagement. Just like our students, it's vital that our teachers feel connected, that they feel engaged. So working to foster connections can contribute to a more supportive environment and a culture for our teachers where they can imagine what is possible in their work. Fostering teacher engagement is complex, and it's work that needs to be approached from different angles. But, you know, don't overlook the power of conversation and building those relationships. School leaders can use conversations to allow teachers to be heard and have them feel valued. It's also an opportunity for teachers to better understand each other's experiences and for leaders to know their perspectives will they gain insight into the temperature of the organization and they can identify areas where they can act upon. 
Student and teacher engagement is so important. It kind of goes along with the ownership of what they're learning. It's important for students and teachers both to be reflective on what they're learning, and that in itself can be pretty um, engaging, but we also try to design engaging work for our students. We try to give them lots of opportunities for choices. We try to give them lots of opportunities for collaboration. We use Kagan Strategies, which is all about collaboration and working together and learning together. We give our students an opportunity to um, see novel, novelty in their learning. So it's not always the same way of learning something. There's novel ways of, of doing things. Our teachers try to make sure that they also emphasize different learning uh, modalities so that there's visual, there's tactile, there's um, auditorial. So there's lots of different ways for students to learn and teachers to to plan around that learning and design around that learning. We also try to do the same thing for our teachers as far as professional development, trying to meet their needs. Some learn best through book studies, some learn best through ongoing coaching, some learn best through come in and talk to me about what you see in my, in my teaching or in my classroom. They also love to go into each other's classrooms and help each other um, learn, learn more about what they're doing. So I believe that teacher and student in, engagement is so important and my teachers have really embraced, embraced setting that up for our students. Uh, recently I've learned about the story from one of our uh, ward education officers in one of our trainings. Uh, the officer said once he was a teacher at a certain school, primary school, he had this uh, standard three class. This were the students who were uh, on the average of nine years old each. And so during the, during the, the, the particular class, he had this challenge that the students were shy and couldn't talk. And so he said he, he, he just brainstormed about which strategy he can use to make the class engage. And then he heard some stories from the teacher that these students uh, couldn't, does not know really well Swahili. Yeah, Swahili is our national language. And so uh, some of the students have their, uh, I mean, using vernacular language. So there was just a barrier in Swahili language to these children. And so he started to say, to brainstorm of what strategy he can use to make his class engaged. And then he came up with one idea to have uh, a certain, some kind of speech, something like a morning speech to standard three students. Just uh, so he told his students to have uh, each, uh, each to have one thing to learn about. So at the beginning, he started to share, he started to share uh, the stories. And later on, the students were like, "Yo, teacher, tomorrow is me. Tomorrow is me. I, it's, it should be my turn. It should be my turn." Later on, everyone in the class was so engaged, and they want to perform. I mean, to to have their session, to provide a morning speech. So. He later on ran out of ideas to share with the children, I mean ran out of topics. Later on he told the children if you want to provide a morning speech you should come with something to talk about. And one day one student came with the story of Obama. <laughs> He saw the passion that you now the students are going back at home and made some research and engaged their relatives that, you know, mom, dad, oh sister, please help me. I need to get a topic to speak about tomorrow. Give me the content. Give me, I mean, some updates about the content. So it was very engaging. And later on, it moved from class to actually the general assembly where the from standard one to standard seven I attended the session and everyone wanted to be there to have pro to pro provide this morning speech and so what we are learning from this story from uh, our word education officer was former the teacher he didn't see the language challenge as a barrier he didn't see the the uh, small age as the barrier but he saw the potential that these children if they can talk to one another well 
they can talk here in class as well and they can have something to present yeah however that something is so to engage the students he just he just went with the flow of their age and what they know and what they can do even if in in a small context and go with the gap to make sure that uh, these students participate in class and I'm sure through that morning speeches even in math session even in English session literature session these children we are also engaged But you measure matters. There are many benefits of using data to drive instruction, to increase learning and build continuous improvement. Hay muchos beneficios de usar los datos para impulsar la instrucción, para aumentar el aprendizaje y para construir una mejora continua. Another thing that we have learned from this Teach United seminars or program is data, student data. We have different datas that we are collecting from students and this kind of data has helped to assess not only students also teachers. We assess ourselves that how far we are on teaching and learning process. But specifically when we look on this results data, it helps teachers to know who are scoring above average, also those who are scoring below average. And uh, to my side, I use these data to create new groups. For example, it can take to, I mean, few students, maybe three students from those who are scoring higher. And also I pick maybe two students from those who are scoring low or below, below average. So this, when I create these groups, I used to, I used to give task to do. So through participation, through doing that task that I gave, you can find those who have slow, I mean, who have, who are slow learners or who have low performance, they are eagerly want to do as how those who are scoring higher do. So you can find that they are improving. In our schools today, data has become an important and omnipresent resource around which teachers and schools shape their instruction. Successful assessment includes many parts. While it's important to have assessments that provide larger pieces of data, such as interim benchmark assessments, it's also important to remember that the most powerful assessment is often not even separate from instruction, but included as an integral part. For example, using the strategy of formative assessment conducting checks for understanding along the way, in the moments that students interact with the content rather than after, allows assessments to move from being just another number or score to be an active roadmap. We are able to look at learning as it happens to adjust our lessons along the way and strategically plan for what comes next. Students are at the center of assessment. Collecting data should not simply be about giving a score to measure towards growth or proficiency, then moving on. It shouldn't just be a number collected in a gradebook or put on a report card. It's about using data as a meaningful point to jumpstart conversations with students to help them reflect critically on the process of their own learning. Conversations around data should serve to orient students in their successes and also help make goals for those areas where they're not there yet. Students can play a meaningful role to help drive interim assessments. Sometimes the most meaningful data allows students to personally evaluate their errors, then resubmit for another score. Giving students some voice and choice in how they are assessed can also be invaluable. For example, one strategy currently being used in the US is assessment through choice boards. In this way, teachers allow students to choose from several authentic products. While the standard multiple choice assessment has its place, providing these multiple options for how assessment can happen and how it can look widens the lens of student performance and student learning. Teachers are also at the center of assessment. It's their target conversations in professional learning communities, for example, that make data have meaning. Much as with data center conversations with students, putting teacher conversation at the center drives reflection 
and creates meaningful goal setting to help students move forward. At the heart of it all, data is the crux for school-wide conversations that move students forward. Para mí, un ejemplo de buenas prácticas sería la evaluación o la autoevaluación, pero después de cada clase o tema. Es que antes eh, lo practicaba hasta un mes después de cerrar un tema. Entonces, es una práctica muy bonita y te permite saber de forma inmediata si se logró o no la comprensión total o parcial acerca de un tema específico. Pero este, sería al cerrar cada clase, por ejemplo, con las notas o tarjetas adhesivas, se logra saber si un estudiante o varios necesitan más ayuda, lo entendieron bien o si de plano podría enseñarles a otras personas. De esa forma te organizas y nos permitirá reunir fácilmente a los estudiantes en la clase siguiente para diferenciarlos mejor de acuerdo con sus necesidades o sus aprendizajes específicos, según lo que ellos nos expresaron en esas tarjetas. Me ha enseñado y ayudado a hacer conciencia acerca de la forma en la que enseño, porque por mi especialidad ya conocía y había puesto en práctica algunas herramientas tecnológicas. Sin embargo, no me detenía a hacer tanta reflexión en si la forma en la que lo estaba haciendo estaba bien o en si motivaba o ayudaba a que mis estudiantes comprendieran y aprendieran de una manera más efectiva o de una forma más consciente acerca de su propio proceso de aprendizaje. Um, thank you so much. I, I'm so proud of the work of this team, and I just really want to thank um, our partner teachers, um, heads of school, the Teach United team that, that shared their examples today. I'm Heather Heaps. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Teach United, and I got some really great, great questions from everyone in the chat. Um, you just heard a few examples of growth mindset, student engagement, student data. Those are three of the topics that we dive into um, in great detail um, in our full teacher, teacher coaching program because those strategies are some that have been shown to have the highest student impact. So we do have a couple of um, questions that came in for our presenters. If I don't get to your question today or you have another question, please email us at partnerships at teachunited.org. So it's partnerships at teachunited.org if we don't get to your question here. Um, but we have a great question here about impact from Edna. Um, she said that teacher shortages are a concern in a lot of countries. So wanted to know how Teach United is collaborating with the countries to achieve high student outcomes. Um, and that's a really great question because we believe that there can be no systemic change unless you're working with the system. So we always partner directly with, you know, whether it's the State Department in the US or a Ministry of Education in other countries, we do sign MOUs and we set our goals together with the local districts and with uh, the regional governments. Um, because we want to build the capacity of educators in the system. We want to build capacity, not dependency on our organization. So that's how we um, identify our participants. That's how we identify the specific goals. And then we wrap that into kind of a custom uh, program based on these three uh, key units. Um, but the other question, the other follow up part of that was, um, you know, it's wonderful to hear firsthand how educators are incorporating these strategies, but how do you know they're really making a difference for students? And that's such a good question because oftentimes programs will count their impact as participation, the number of teachers who maybe attended a workshop, um, but really we count impact as whether or not it's moving the needle for student outcomes. So our goal is to improve student outcomes, um, and so we focus on measuring uh, quantitative data, student achievement, um, student growth, academic, you know, using state exams, things like uh, literacy rates, math comprehension. So there's a very academic outcome component to it. But we also have a qualitative set of monitoring and evaluation where we look at um, teacher observations, uh, student surveys, teacher feedback to really see if the practice in the classroom is changing. And then that gives us data on things like engagement, collaboration, and that teacher practice. And I do want to toss it over to our Director of Product and Implementation um, and Monitoring and Evaluation, Aaliyah, if you have anything that you want to add around that monitoring and evaluation impact piece. Sure. Uh, thanks, Heather. I, you hit a lot of the pieces, but um, we're 
I'll say moderately obsessive about making sure we're measuring impact and not just reach. Um, and I really appreciate that because uh, a great program is only as good as being able to show it's great in some ways. Uh, so as Heather mentioned, we're collecting data from multiple sources. Um, so in some of our regions, we do have national exams. So like in Tanzania, we're looking at the NECTA exams, which include both primary school leaving exams and secondary school exams. But we're not just measuring based on kind of one year's worth of data, uh, like after the program is finished, we're actually looking at data to make sure the program is sustained. So looking at data before Teach United partnered with a school all the way to after. Um, and by looking at that more longitudinally, we're able to see that we're not seeing kind of regression after impact. Um, to, so as an example, um, some for our secondary schools, one of our, uh, they were at 33rd percentile rank uh, nationally overall in the, for the year before we partnered with them. And then three years after we've worked with them, they'd increased 34 national percentile points in rank. And that's kind of just one example. We have a lot and I will not go into all the data because that takes too long. But when we're looking at this longitudinally, we want to make sure whether it's we're looking at national exam rates in Tanzania, pass rates in Costa Rica, as well as those surveys, those attitudes, behaviors, and belief surveys Heather mentioned. We're looking to see that the impact is sustainable, um, that it's going to be something that's going to help improve outcomes, not just for the years we're there, but for the years ahead. Thanks, Aaliyah, and sit tight because the next question is gonna to come to you also. Um, and I love that you call this moderately obsessive about data. Nice, it's nicely obsessive. <laughs> nicely, nicely obsessive, right. Um, so another question here is, given the work in such unique geographies and socioeconomic conditions, how does material get adapted for regional context? And so Aaliyah, if you want to address that from a product side and then maybe Megan Casey can jump in there um, with, from a regional perspective as well. Sure. Uh, yeah, this is one of my favorite pieces about the work we do. Um, so if we consider engagement as an example, there's a research base we have that tells us about kind of how engagement works broadly, um, that we need to have high commitment, not, only, not just high attention, but what high engagement looks like in different geographies and different locations, it's going to be very, very different. And part of that's cultural norms, part of it's language based. Uh, part of it's available resources for understanding and assessing engagement. So what we do is we kind of start with a foundation of within the courses, there's baseline theory and kind of foundational knowledge, but that's supplemented. And like there, I can say this because I'm the one who works on the courses. Far more important is actually the work that the individual teams do to take the lead for the trainings, the workshops and the coaching which takes all that knowledge and puts it into context. So Megan, I'd love to have you talk a little bit about the work that the Latin America team has been doing on to kind of contextualize this broad, these broader concepts for your appropriate context. Sure, thank you, Aliyah. Um, this is one of our favorite things to work on and certainly um, we have an amazing team. So yeah, the context, contextualizing the, the, the resources. In, unfortunately, in the Spanish language, there's not a lot of materials available, um, not nearly as much as there is in English, for example. So we've been able to um, work with our partners on the ground with our school leaders and, um, and local educators to create videos, to create um, the resources that reflect our, our actual context. Um, so instead of, using voiceovers and um, subtitles on US videos, for example, uh, we've been able to create a lot of our own materials um, that reflect a Costa Rican classroom um, or you know, our, our own language and strategies that our teachers are using on the ground because it's, it's different. You know, sometimes we have totally different materials. Sometimes we have totally different classrooms, ideas, strategies. So it's been really fun um, to work on that piece. And it's something that that we continue to do. And, and I think it's a never ending uh, process. Um, and, and, that, and as Jones, our educational director always says, it's not about us 
necessarily giving all the information to our partners, but working together and really, you know, coming up with with the tools and the resources that each context needs, that each school needs on the ground. Thanks, Aaliyah and Megan. We are um, we're out of time. So if I didn't get to your question, please do email us at partnerships at teachunited.org. Um, I really want to thank our partners in Latin America, East Africa, and US um, representatives of Teach United uh, that came today. Um, and then our team that answered questions in the chat box. Also, um, we have board members here, we have partners, we have donors. Um, special thanks to Judy Farney for joining us today. Remember, you're going to receive a recording of today's presentation in the coming days, so watch your um, inbox for that. And really, truly, we believe that no matter what sustainable development goal you focus on, whether it's climate, gender equality, or poverty, no complex issue is going to be solved um, while only certain populations have access to a great education. So all sustainable development goals, we feel, come back to supporting great education. So thank you for supporting this great work, and thank you for joining us today. Have a great rest of your day.